What you leave behind is not what is engraved on stone monuments, but what is woven into the lives of others. The Greek statesman Pericles said this 2,500 years ago, and I believe it's as true today as it was then. He's talking about one's legacy. Hi, I'm Joseph King, a program director at the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Energy within the DOE. Today, I'd like to talk to you about legacy, our legacy, and an approach we might use to mitigate the principal cause of climate change, human-produced carbon dioxide. The approach I'd like to discuss is known as accelerated geomineralization. Currently, the energy and cement sectors produce just north of 35 billion metric tons of CO2 annually. Total global production estimates run as high as 51 billion metric tons. Speak, people speak about carbon capture and sequestration, or CCS, and carbon capture utilization and sequestration, CCUS, but total utilization and valorization opportunities are extremely small relative to the real size of the problem. So small that storage or entombment becomes a mandatory requirement for reaching curtailment, net zero, or net negative goals. Before we get into why I think mineralization is critically important, let's review a few of the terrestrial approaches commonly proposed as sequestration solutions. This slide shows a common representation of an oil and gas production site. Note the shallow well used to collect natural gas, a much deeper unproductive well known as a dry well, ironically full of water, and the mid-level sweet spot is where the crude oil lies. Overlaying all of this is the cap rock, usually a sedimentary rock layer composed of sandstone or shale that entraps it all. Once depleted of these valuable fossil resources, you're left with a storage space for other fluids. This is what most groups propose as the, the major, most reasonable sequestration site. You might ask, well, do we know how to get the CO2 down there? Absolutely. The oil and gas industry has been using a variety of fluids, including CO2, to do enhanced oil recovery for more than 50 years. But it is not quite as simple or clean as depicted here. Usually wells for miles so show some level of enhancement as the CO2 migrates all around. So Joe, if the space is already there, and we know how to fill it, what's the concern? Well, first off, we've taken a perfectly good diaphragm that has worked for millions of years and punched tens of thousands of little holes in it. But you might wonder, can't we just plug the holes with cement once we fill the space below? Yes, you could if you knew where all the adjacent holes were too. Many spent abandoned wells date back to the 19th century, and we di didn't even start an accurate record keeping system until around the 1950s. But even if we could locate all the holes and plug them, modern cements only last 50 to 70 years. Geologists will tell you things like, mineralization takes thousands and thousands of years, usually longer. You might as well dump nuclear waste down these holes since it will decay to a safe level faster than natural mineralization will ever occur. Second, commonly used plugging techniques are known to leak. Cements and concretes are brittle materials prone to cracking and powdering. For example, one of my colleagues ran a workshop on orphaned and abandoned natural gas wells. Of the estimated 3 million wells, the drilling experts said that the majority, if not all, leaked at some level. And these are low pressure spent wells where the methane gas doesn't even react with the cements or concrete plug. <clears throat> this is not the case for CO2. All cements and concrete structures continue to react and degrade in the presence of CO2 in air by a process called carbonation. This impacts the long-term integrity of the plugs, shortening their useful lifetime. What you see here is a schematic of CO2 neutralizing and penetrating a concrete block. You see the carbonate front 
and it goes through and neutralizes, weakening and cracking the material as it goes. Now, most of the carbonate models, carbonation models were developed when the CO2 in the air was in a sub 400 parts per million level. However, my concern is the fact that pure carbon dioxide gas or liquid would be greater than 2,500 times more concentrated, leading to accelerated embrittlement and strength loss. Supercritical CO2 at greater than 1,000 PSI should be even faster. Doing a downhole simple storage of liquid or CO2 gas is just not the right thing to do, but it is the cheapest and easiest thing to do. If we do this, we'll congratulate ourselves for our gallant effort, and decades from now, when all these wells start to blow, it will be rapidly, it will rapidly, it will rapidly reverse decades of a sincere effort to stop climate change. Third, should these wells blow, the first result of a catastrophic plug failure will be that, what I call, the Lake Nyos effect. Lake Nyos is a deep caldera in Cameroon filled with water that collected carbon dioxide at the bottom from natural seepage. In 1986, some turbulent event caused it to release 1 billion cubic meters of CO2 in less than an hour. This formed a wall of suffocating gas 15 kilometers long and 50 meters high. It killed all animal life in its path before it dissipated into the atmosphere. I believe this type of event will become a common part of our future should we follow our current path. Now, I'm not here to merely tell tales of woe and gloom, but to offer one of hope, technical challenge, and a great opportunity, and that is accelerated geomineralization. So, you might ask, what is that? Well, it's simply turning CO2 back into a rock or mineral, much like limestone or dolomite. It is a process first proposed by Seifritz back in the 1990s. It is the reaction of a metal oxide with carbon dioxide. With the right type of act reactive rock in an active form, the reaction is exothermic. It gives off heat. It wants to happen. For example, some of the rocks you might recognize, olivine, serpentine, wollastonite, all these, once activated, rapidly re react with CO2. Now, there are three types of mineralization scientists talk about, ex situ, surficial, and in situ. I'm not really interested in the first two, although they are extremely important. I look at them as foundational bricks, and I truly believe that if we get enough of these bricks, we can build a new world. Unfortunately, these are only 100 million ton bricks in a 50 billion ton problem. We just don't have enough of these bricks. This is why downhole sequestration or in situ mineralization are so important to managing climate change. They are the tens of billions of tons to hundreds of billions of tons solution. Now, you may have guessed, traditional sequestration, not a big fan. So you might then ask, well, Joe, didn't you just tell us that in situ mineralization usually takes thousands and thousands of years. Well, yes, I did. That's why I took great interest in a number of reports out of Iceland, where they observed unusually rapid mineralization and complete consumption of the injected carbon dioxide in under two years. They took core samples to validate their observations to confirm which minerals were being formed. They attributed the, ra uh, the rapid reaction to having special or suitable basaltic rock in Iceland relative to other places. For me, the key phrase here was suitable basaltic rock. Not very scientific, but a directionally important clue. Iceland, as you know, is basically a lump of basaltic rock on a highly volcanic zone. It is well known that in order to get a material like molestinite, limestone for Portland cement, or metakaolin to react, you need to thermally pre-activate them prior to their use. 
you use generally a kiln. Now, if you look at the earth as a dynamic chemical reactor, then magma and volcanoes are nature's natural kilns. As such, they activate in calcine rocks by dehydration, that's the loss of water, and decarboxylation, the loss of CO2. And if these rocks stay in this virgin activated state, like the basalts in Iceland, they are primed to react with CO2, resulting in accelerated mineralization. However, rocks exposed to decaying biomass and petroleum fluids for millions and millions of years seem to be highly passivated or deactivated. In addition, these oil and gas sites are generally not in basaltic or mafic environments. This difference would explain the wide variance in reactivity reported in the scientific literature. Now, my colleagues at NREL have already mapped where we should look for similar opportunities. This is a map of the geothermal sites across the United States. Note that they do not include the Bakken, the Marcellus, the Appalachian, the Barnett, the Eagle Ford, or the Permian basins where most of our spent oil and gas wells are located. As a result, one wouldn't expect mineralization to occur there ever. So the challenge is, if the Icelanders have stumbled across a key that puts them on the path to solving this significant issue, imagine what an army of highly motivated, focused scientists and engineers <clears throat> using world-class American laboratories and facilities could accomplish. So you have to ask yourself, what do you want your legacy to be? What do you leave behind? I'm Joseph King, and thanks for listening to what I believe is a fantastic opportunity to solve a critical American and global issue.